And welcome back to Strips News Tonight. I'm Del Walters, live in Washington, D.C. tonight. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter died on Sunday. She was 96. She was known for being an incredibly active First Lady alongside her husband, the former President Jimmy Carter. She frequently sat in on his cabinet meetings. She lobbied state legislators to enact the Equal Rights Amendment, also testifying before Congress for a bill that President Carter wound up signing, expanding funding for mental health care. After leaving the White House, she picked up a hammer, among other things, and joined her husband in human rights and humanitarian work. The Carters founded the human rights advocacy group, the Carter Center, also working, as you see here, with Habitat for Humanity. Both Carters, by the way, worked on, get this number, more than 4,000 homes. She traveled the world and proved that for her, all roads led back to Plains, Georgia. It's where she grew up and where she will be buried. Scripps News national correspondent Mara Sirianni takes a look back at southern roots that call the Georgia soil home. Rosalind and Jimmy Carter were married for 77 years, but they've known each other much longer than that. Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Smith grew up in Plains, Georgia, and were neighbors. Jimmy's mom, Lillian, was a registered nurse who helped deliver Rosalind. And when Jimmy was three years old, she brought him to visit the new kid on the block. The longest married presidential couple in U.S. history, the two went on their first date in 1945. Jimmy was home for the summer from attending the U.S. Naval Academy in his final year of college and had plans to marry another girl. But those fell through and then he met 17-year-old Rosalind. 20-year-old Jimmy stole a kiss from her on their first date and told his mom he wanted to marry her. Rosalind said in an interview when Jimmy first proposed, she turned him down because she promised her father she'd finish college before tying the knot. But Jimmy won her heart and they married in July of 1946. Rosalind helped Jimmy win the governorship of Georgia in 1970 and then decided to focus on mental health as the Peach State's first lady. She also helped campaign for Jimmy when he ran for president in 1976, beating Gerald Ford. Rosalind said they ate lunch together every Wednesday in the Oval Office to discuss personal finances, their children, and the issues they cared about. In her book, First Lady from Plains, Rosalind said she acted as a sounding board for her husband, and when rumors were circulating that she was telling Jimmy what to do, she said, quote, they didn't know Jimmy. We always worked side by side. After leaving the White House in 1981, the two contributed to the expansion of the nonprofit Habitat for Humanity and also founded the Carter Center, a non-governmental, nonprofit organization working on world peace, fighting disease, and building hope. Both received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1999. The couple have four children and 22 grand and great-grandchildren. The Carters returned to Plains and were active members of the Marantha Baptist Church, where they taught Sunday school. When asked which of his accomplishments he was most proud of, President Carter said that marrying Rosalind was, quote, the pinnacle of my life. Mara Sirianni, thank you very much. They are revered in Plains and, and beloved around the world. Their legacy stretches to the White House and beyond. Our next guest can help put Mrs. Carter's work into perspective. Andrew Oak is the author of a massive multi-volume book on the lives and legacies of our first ladies. Andrew, she was called the Steel Magnolia. She was soft-spoken and quiet, but a powerhouse behind the scenes. That's correct. You know, the power of the Carters is the power of two. In my studies and the books that you mentioned from the C-SPAN White House Historical Association series, uh, First Ladies Influence and Image, I studied first ladies. I tried to separate from their, them from their husbands. Uh, we know enough about the presidents. We know about the presidents' lives. We've written about the presidents' lives. We wanted to hear about the ladies. I wanted it to be all about the ladies. It's almost impossible to separate the Carters. They were there in planes together from the very beginning, from infancy. President Carter's mother, Miss Lillian, not only helped deliver Mrs. Carter, but she also helped her father, Edgar, pass away as a hospice nurse later in life. Mrs. Carter would go out that night that her father died to the Carter family peanut farm to spend time with Jimmy Carter's sisters, who she was very good friends with. They went to school together. It's a lifetime together. It's a lifetime to be celebrated. 
It's an American love story, but more importantly, it's a story of public service that lasted 96 and even 99 years with President Carter that was endless and tireless. And I love that video that you're showing where President Carter is hammering the nail in and Mrs. Carter's right there because it's symbolic of their entire relationship and how they worked hand in hand, side by side, traveled the world to make the world a better place for all human beings. Andrew, and that is the question that I was going to ask you. Do they, I guess, symbolize the best of America? Um, we hear so much talk about make America great again. But in this case, you had somebody that came from humble roots, that became a governor in a state, then became the president of the United States, lost an election, conceded defeat to the man who lost, even though there are some these days that even to this day maintain that the hostage release in Iran, the Iranian hostages, was somehow rigged for Ronald Reagan. Jimmy Carter never said a word about that. Rosalind Carter never said a word about that. Then they went to Plains, Georgia. They went back. He taught Sunday school. They were in church. My sister visited them in church. They were about as humble as you got. Never made money off of the White House, just public servants, key word being servants. Well, they lived now until the very end of Mrs. Carter's last days in a very humble rambler there in Plains. I've spent a lot of time in Plains. I'm very close with some family members on the Carter and Smith side. It was some of the first text messages I sent and the first phone calls I made to give my sympathy and express my deepest heartfelt thoughts to that family I am now close to and share with in Plains, Georgia. I was very, very fortunate to meet Mrs. Carter and celebrate her 95th birthday in Plains uh, when we were dedicating a childhood garden, which is next to the home where she grew up in, and a beautiful sculpture by my friend Peter Hazel. Uh, it's just it's just incredible with 18 butterflies that symbolize August 18th, the day that she was born. And I gave her a signed set of my books and told her about the series and thanked her for for her lifetime of service, even then last year. And she thanked me. And and I was I was just very very fortunate to be there in general, but be at the position where her sister Alethea helped her over with her walker to light this statue, this, this butterfly statue in the garden there lights up. It's absolutely beautiful, magnificent. And after she lit it, she turned around and saw me again and came over with her little walker and she grabbed my hand and she held it very firmly, but very, very, very lovingly. And she just said, thank you so much for being here. And she was still at that point thanking me and I just couldn't thank her enough and thank the family enough for sharing her with us in the world. And it does symbolize what's best, not only just in America, but what's best in human beings and as we couple and partner and, together. And, and when was the last time you saw a first couple on a kiss cam at, at a game, at a sporting event? I mean, that speaks for itself. But I, I want to move on to how powerful she was behind the scenes. In the years since, we have had more politically active first ladies. There was Nancy Reagan, Hillary Clinton, for example. How extraordinary, though, was Rosalind Carter's approach to being first lady? Because as I mentioned, she sat in on cabinet meetings, and I remember when Hillary Clinton did the same in the Clinton administration, there was an uproar. How dare she? She was not elected. He was. But Rosalind Carter did exactly the same thing. Certainly. And there was controversy over that when Nancy Reagan would advise President Reagan. And you can go back to Bess Truman as one of what uh, President Harry Truman's closest confidants, advisors, and, and was in on on. on probably more more discussions than we knew about. But Mrs. Carter just really, she was there at every step of the way, from the campaign to the administration, to the cabinet meetings, to the advisory meetings. And she just, she kept going even after the White House. I mean, the list of things that she did for mental health alone, the different um, symposiums that she hosted, the different boards she sat on, the honorary fellowships, and she wasn't just putting her names on things, and she wasn't just putting a face on there and being a figurehead. I can tell you this, from knowing them personally and knowing the family and knowing the friends down in Plains, the Carters did not do anything they did not want to do and feel very strongly about. And the Carters didn't do anything that they didn't feel strongly about. They were not, they were not forced into doing things. And I think I think this is exemplified by just a month ago at the Peanut Festival in Plains, Georgia. Right. Mrs. There they were. Mrs. Carter, the president, they're there. They're in the parade. They're going down the, 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 the Main Street in the SUV. And, and that was their idea. They, they, they ran the roost and they ran the, the, the business there in Plains. And they went out and got among the people and among the public and among their friends and families when they wanted to on their terms. Andrew, talk about when she was first lady. She came about during a revolution in, in women's rights. 
women were burning their bra. I remember basically the commercials on television saying, you've come a long way, baby, and look where you've got to today. We've got our own cigarettes, for, for instance. She was one of the ones blazing the trail behind the scenes, and yet she was never, ever regarded as a feminist in the, the role or the mode, for instance, of a Gloria Steinem. How did she manage to do so much during such a turbulent time in American history and not be branded as someone that people didn't like? Well, she wasn't, even if she was radical and progressive in her thinking and what she supported, she didn't do it in a radical or offensive way. She was true to her word and true to her actions. One of the most sincere and humble human beings I've ever met or I've ever studied in any of the first ladies. And you see this genuine quality in her. You see, I mean, the first ladies typically poll higher than their husbands anyway, because that's the, that's the role of the first lady and people always like them better, so to, so to speak. But Mrs. Carter took that popularity and took that role and took it in a new direction and took it in a direction of things, again, like mental health, that were not on the forefront of everyone's thought. They were not, um, they, they, these were taboo subjects. You you could argue Mrs. Ford did the same thing with breast cancer and addiction. Mrs. Carter did that with mental health. No one else was talking about it. We wouldn't be talking about it in the way that we do today if she didn't do it. And she took that role and stepped out in ways that other first ladies had not and did it in such a sincere way, you couldn't help but like her and, and try and understand where she was coming from and learn more about what she was talking about. Fascinating. I read in your work that her middle name was Eleanor, and she is often compared to Eleanor Roosevelt. Andrew Oak, uh, the First Lady's man. Andrew, as always, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you.